Good evening. I'm Carl Strickwerda, president of Elizabethtown College, and I welcome you all to our community tonight and to this evening's program entitled Afghanistan, Civil Society, Past, Present, and Future. Elizabethtown College was founded in 1899 by members of the Church of the Brethren, one of our nation's historic peace churches. As a community of moral learning, we are dedicated to educating our students for lives of service and leadership as citizens of the world. Our mission statement highlights our long-held belief that learning is most noble when used to benefit others and when it affirms the values of peace, nonviolence, human dignity, and social justice. Some words of thanks are in order. First, a special note of gratitude to Judy and Paul Ware for their exceptional service to the college, particularly to our peacemaking initiatives. And we're very pleased that Judy's with us tonight. Over the years, Paul and Judy have supported the college's heritage and values through the sponsorship of the Judy S. and Paul W. Ware Colloquium on Peacemaking and Global Citizenship here at Elizabethtown. And as many of you know, the signature event of that support comes every spring when a Nobel Peace Prize winner comes as the Ware Lecturer. Another key sponsor of tonight's event is a new center that we have recently formed on campus, the Center for Global Understanding and Peacemaking. The center organized this evening's program on Afghanistan as part of an ongoing series that takes on global issues and brings experts to campus to help inform students, faculty, staff, and the larger community about the complex issues that we face. A big thank you to Kay Wolf of the center who administers so many of the events and the organization and who excels in her role of pulling all the diverse pieces and details together for an event like this. Thanks too to Brian Helm of the ITS department here at the college who helps with uh, the technology. And thanks too to the programs and academic departments that urge students to pay particular attention to world issues. And so many of you I, I see are here tonight and I'm grateful for that. Our schedule for this evening looks like this. Following my comments, I will turn the podium over to the moderator who will give opening remarks and introduce the panel. After our panel, we will open the floor for question and answer, a question and answer period. If you have a question, please indicate uh, and stand and speak so that we can, we can all hear your, um, your question. We will wrap up after the questions after about 30 or so minutes. A small reception will follow the formal seminar and will invite you to continue interaction with our panelists. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for this evening's seminar. Professor Jonathan Rudy is Elizabethtown College's Global Peacemaking Scholar in Residence. John currently teaches the practical experience-oriented courses for the Peace and Conflict Studies minor, a course known as Peace Building Themes and Trends. Jonathan began teaching at Elizabethtown College last year he came to us with over 25 years of living and working with African and Asian grassroots non-governmental organizations and independent conflict transformation consultants. He has worked in more than 25 countries on development and peace building efforts. In particular, Jonathan has a 12 year association with the Mindano, Mindan, Mindanao, thank you, Peace Building Institute in the Southern Philippines where he teaches two courses annually. Conflict transformation among military officers has been an exciting part of his peace-building paradigm in the last five years. Last year, he co-facilitated a mediation skills course with a Philippine paramilitary organization in their own rural camp. In May this year, he will again travel to the Philippines and help develop a new community peace-building classroom and field exposure course in Mindanao. In 2011 and 2012, Professor Rudy worked in Afghanistan, the topic of our discussion tonight, giving technical support to Oxfam's community peace building projects during four different trips. With time in Afghanistan totaling more than three months, he experienced firsthand the Taliban spring offensive attack on Kabul in April of last year. Next month, he will be traveling to Somalia to establish a relationship between Elizabethtown College and the University of Hargeza Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies. 
Please welcome with me Professor Rudy as he introduces this evening's topic and panelists. Well, thank you, uh, President Strickwerda, for that uh, introduction. We're very excited about the focus of the topic tonight, not just because of the seminar that we'll uh, introduce and we'll have in just a few moments, but because we've already had a chance to speak to Pennsylvania Senator Casey this afternoon, or this morning, uh, in his Harrisburg office um, to speak with his South Asian foreign policy advisor about our views on Afghanistan. Tomorrow, Radio Smart Talk on WITF has invited Hasina and I uh, to speak on Afghan education and civil society. This is a new and exciting territory for the Center of Global Understanding and Peacemaking here at Elizabethtown College. Now, this evening's WARE seminar is entitled Afghanistan, Civil Society, Past, Present, and Future. For both Afghanistan and the US, it's a critical time to be reflecting on the past dozen years of cooperation and combat present on the ground realities and the future relationship between the two countries. The war in Afghanistan has been our nation's longest. The US and NATO are winding down combat operations and drawing down the massive foreign troop presence uh, that is uh, present in Afghanistan. So the withdrawal raises timing issues uh, and serious questions that include what has been accomplished since 2001, how will the next few years unfold, and who can give leadership to the country so that all Afghans can enjoy a prosperous and peaceful future. There's an Afghan proverb that says, a good year is determined by, this, by its spring roughly meaning that the beginning of things can predict how things unfold. It's another springtime in Afghanistan, and tonight this seminar will explore one of the capacities that will help Afghanistan move into the future, and that is civil society. Now, when trying to understand Afghanistan, one must be, uh, be self-reflective and aware of the multitude of perspectives which are being used to explain such a complicated and multi-layered place. Tonight we will use various perspectives, I will use various perspectives on Afghanistan uh, to help explain, to give you the background, and then to focus on civil society contributions. First, I would like to give some background, and a good starting place for that is some historical perspective. In what is current day Afghanistan, archeologists believe urbanization developed as many as 4,000 years ago. Buddhism arrived 300 years before the common era, and by the seventh century CE, Islam had taken precedence. The Silk Road cut through Afghanistan, bringing vibrant trade and culture to the area. Afghans have also seen a uh, constant attention from emperors such as Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan marching in conquest through her rugged terrain. Afghanistan was used as a buffer state in the 19th century between the British and the Russian empires. During the Cold War, the US and Russia vied for influence, culminating in the 1978 seizure of power in the Soviet-backed Sour Revolution and the following year, a full invasion by the Soviets. Th that 10-year conflict during Soviet occupation resulted in the loss of over a million lives and six million displaced persons. The Mujahideen, a, lo a loosely aligned group opposed to pro-Soviet government, used American weapons and monies totaling up to $40 billion to precipitate the Soviet withdrawal uh, in 1989. From 1990 until the Taliban took Kabul in September 1996, political instability plagued Afghanistan. This period from 1996 to 2002 was one of brutal repression, consolidation of power, and systematic house arrest of half the population, women. In October 2001, the US launched Operation Enduring Freedom, 
which propelled the Northern Alliance in its sweep south to take Kabul in December 2001. The government under Hamid Karzai was formed and the UN Security Council established an international, secure, uh, international security assistance force called ISAF to provide security to the fledgling government. That, what I just said, was a wholly inadequate sweep of history and I think we'll hear some more from our panelists this evening. Now, if we change perspectives a bit and we do look at uh, something, uh, we look at Afghanistan through the lenses of uh, geography and demographics, uh, we can say that Afghanistan is slightly smaller than the state of Texas, if that helps you to, uh, to know how big it is. 77% of people live in rural areas. And Afghanistan is not just one people, but made up of more than a dozen ethnic groups who speak many languages. It is 99% Muslim, 80% of whom are Sunni, and 19% of whom are Shia. The country has a population of 30 million with a median age of 18 years old. According to the CIA fact book, the average life expectancy is less than 50 years, and its female population has only a 13% literacy rate. But I must add that reliable statistics are difficult to get in Afghanistan. Another perspective on Afghanistan comes from being an outsider. The big picture view from aircraft or from drones does render the rugged beauty of the country, but it fails to yield the complex and sometimes harsh, sometimes harsh realities on the ground. Due to security concerns, the perspective of Americans who have been on the ground level in Afghanistan has been equally problematic in understanding the history and depth of Afghanistan. Be it through the gun port of an armored personnel carrier used by the military, or behind barbed wire and blast walls to protect, for the protection of humanitarian agencies, the isolation between Americans and Afghans due to security issues has been an apartheid that keeps foreigners from meeting, listening to, and hearing the concerns of Afghan citizens. Finally, I would like to highlight the financial perspective. 600 uh, billion plus US dollars has been spent on addressing these security concerns of Afghans and the international community by military means. But is there another way? Let me tell you the story of my work with Oxfam, uh, who had projects supporting community peace negotiators. And this story comes from Balkh province. A community peace elder told me the story of a conflict in his community. Two groups were fighting over a piece of land. The conflict got so severe that one group with guns chased the other group through town. The first group sought sanctuary in the home of the peace elder. When the gunmen found where they were hiding, they pounded on the door and demanded that the fleeing group be sent out to be shot. The elder declared that the gunman would have to shoot him first, and being a respected member of his, com his community and an elder, the gunmen were taken aback and didn't fire. The peace elder eventually offered and served tea in true local hospitality to the gunmen after they agreed to disarm. He invited the sanctuary group to join in a full meal and with the disarmed gunmen, the elder ended up solving the problem peacefully. This kind of action is more common than I think we in the West might think it is. It's the traditional resources, small, uh, solving small localized problems with local capacities, and that goes, unknown, uh, goes unnoticed quite often by outsiders. Also noteworthy about this contribution to local peace and security is that the peace elders, wanting to double the size of their program and fund it for the next three years, could have done so at the price of 1.5 minutes worth of US expenditures on the war efforts in Afghanistan. 
So the perspective of these groups, known as civil society, are the perspective we wish to focus and highlight tonight. Civil society, made up of this, all the stakeholders who are not government, represent the largest, most diverse cross-section of uh, Afghan people. Civil society rises to meet the needs left when government is unable or unwilling to address local challenges facing the country. Civil society represents development, education, health, religious organizations, traditional justice systems, women's and youth sectors, among others. All these groups are contributing in a variety of local to national efforts to create a just and equitable world for the people of Afghanistan. They are so often left out of the formula of peace, be it Washington, Doha, Bonn, or Kabul. Where this, is, where this lack of perspective is most striking is the on-again, off-again peace talks between the government, international uh, actors, and the Taliban. We urge policymakers to move from peace talks to a comprehensive peace process, which intimately includes civil society and a national dialogue on peace. Why? Well, civil society in Afghanistan can bring creativity, vision, and most of all, grassroots views and aspirations to the track one actors who are so often insulated from on the ground realities. My work with Oxfam Community Peacebuilding Projects validated my understanding that civil society has the dedication, vision, and capacity necessary for a comprehensive peace process to move forward and even succeed. This seminar tonight brings a prestigious panel of persons who can speak to the perspectives of civil society. Tonight we will hear from our panelists the views on Afghanistan, past, present, and future. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists for this evening. Joyce M. Davis is founder and president of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg and veteran journalist who has lived and worked around the globe. She specializes in Islam and the Middle East and is an author of two books on the subject that has received international acclaim. Davis served as a foreign correspondent and editor for National Public Radio and Knight Ritter newspapers. Her articles document the Taliban's rise and fall in Afghanistan, providing reports from the region and from Washington. Davis has specialized in covering Islam, political movements from the most peaceful to the most militant. Before moving to Harrisburg, she was an associate director of broadcasting for Radio Free Europe and supervised broadcast services to Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and countries of Central Asia. Under her supervision, Radio Free Afghanistan rose to become the leading broadcast service in the country. And in 2006, Davis was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Kyrgyz International University for her work uh, promoting free press in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Joyce's topic for this evening is the importance of Afghanistan in the context of global issues of security and implications for other fragile states and a bit more background on the American situation there. Hasina Shurjan uh, is with us tonight and she is a consummate uh, professional with over 21 years of thorough knowledge and experience in education, business, communication, and journalism. She has founded, she is founder and chief executive officer of Aid Afghanistan for Education, owner and chief executive officer of Bumi Company, an internationally recognized women's owned home, uh, woman owned um, home accessory business. Hasina is the co-author of Toughing It Out in Afghanistan and there are some books available here um, some of those books she has written and published in February 2011. She has published various op-ed pieces in the New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian, USA Today, and more. Hasina received a, a Master's of Public Administration degree from Harvard Kennedy School and an Honorary Doctorate of Law degree from the Queen's University in Canada. 
Hasina's topic will look at the future of Afghanistan, particularly in terms of how education as a major stakeholder in the civic arena can shape the next generation of leaders. Matthew Southworth uh, was born in Poughkeepsie, New York in 1984, and shortly after graduating from high school with honors, Matt joined the U.S. Army as an intelligence analyst in order to help pay for college in the future. While in the Army, Matt served a tour of du duty in northern Iraq near Mosul uh, in 2004. Matt's experience in Iraq turned him uh, against war and into an anti-war activist. In May 2009, Matt graduated magna cum laude from Wilmington College, a small Quaker school in Wilmington, Ohio, with a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science and History and a minor in Psychology. After graduation, Matt spent two months in Israel-Palestine, his second trip to the region, studying Arabic, volunteering at a Christian community center near Bethlehem, and living with a Palestinian family. Currently, Matt works on Afghan, Afghanistan policy and drone issues on Capitol Hill. Matt also organizes young adults around the country by providing the tools that empower the people to influence government through effective lobbying. In August 2011, Matt organized a fact-finding fact mission to Afghanistan. The trip was comprised of congressional staff, journalists, and nonprofit leaders. The trip was done under the radar and without security or Pentagon or State Department support. The delegation met with a range of figures in Afghanistan to include Afghan government officials, international NGO, and opposition figures. The delegation discovered a number of urgent policy changes needed as well as reaffirmed the fact that the U.S. military strategy has failed to deliver peace and stability in Afghanistan and the region. Matt serves on the Board of Directors for Veterans for Peace, and he's an advocacy leader in the pro-peace veteran move, uh, community. His topic for this evening will focus on what is missing from the current transition plan, uh, that is economic and po political pieces, and the use um, and the current climate in Congress. Please welcome with me these three panelists. Now I invite Joyce. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you're taking time out of your evening to be here to talk about a place so far, far away called Afghanistan. But what I'm going to attempt to do in the short time I have is to help you understand why you should care about it. Why, what is this that, why are American troops there? Why should any of us care about what goes on? So when I was a reporter, you already heard that I worked as a Middle East editor for National Public Radio, and much of the time that I was there, in addition to covering, of course, every day the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue, we were covering uh, the rise of the Taliban and, um, and as a military and a political force in Afghanistan. But I was also able to document how this rise to power of the Taliban also aided the rise of a myriad of other Islamic factions that morphed into what we know today as Al-Qaeda. Now, as the Taliban were mobilizing to fight against the forces of, of Ahmed Shah Massoud to basically take over the country from the chaos that you heard Professor Rudy talk about, I traveled to Pakistan to talk, actually, to young men in madrasas there who were really students just like you sitting in here, not much older, not older at all than you, than you are. And that's what Taliban means, students. This was a student-led movement to basically restore some righteous peace to Afghanistan. And they were willing, they told me quite willing, to die to achieve their goal. And they did think that their goal included bringing Islamic law a different form of government to Afghanistan. They did achieve their goal in 1996, and for a while it looked as though they might bring a sense of order to what had been a country in a state of chaos. So why do we care about Afghanistan? Some think it's because of the threat of the Taliban, but we need to recall that these Taliban, these students, 
were not always our enemies. In fact, you heard about the Mujahideen. They weren't our enemies at that time. From 1997 to 2001, when I was a foreign correspondent and editor for Knight Ritter newspapers, this is a chain that owned the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Miami Herald, and a myriad of other newspapers, um, I covered the Taliban as it attempted to establish a government and take its place on the world stage. Many, many people around the world were relieved that the brutal fighting among Afghan warlords was coming to an end and a strong government would take its place. And a strong government did indeed take its place. The Taliban then sent its envoys to offices at the UN and in New York where I often met with their top representatives. Many of them came to Washington where I was based. In fact, as much as they were known for their oppression of women, their spokesperson in Washington in much of the U.S. was a woman, Layla Helms. Um, she was the daughter-in-law of Senator Jesse Helms. And Layla was their mouthpiece. I got to know her quite well. We, we spoke almost on a daily basis. And she was their mouthpiece in Washington before the catastro catastrophic events of September 11, 2001. But my reports carried in newspapers around the country was one of the first reports, if not the first report, to point the finger at Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawari and to alert the world that he was the guest of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan under the rule of the students, the Taliban. I knew this because I had spent that decade reporting on the rise of Islamic extremism and compiling dozens of interviews with those who said they were engaged in jihad against the West and against the United States in particular. You might recall that after September 11, the US President George Bush commanded the Taliban turn over bin Laden and his cohorts, which they refused to do, claiming the preeminence of Afghan hospitality. So weeks of threats and ultimatums were hurled between Washington and Kabul and Layla Helm told me that the Taliban really didn't quite understand what was going on. She says its leaders were a little more than country bumpkins who didn't fully understand the catastrophe that they were creating for themselves and their country in trying to stand up to the United States. She proved to be right. U.S. forces overthrew the Taliban in 2001, only a few months after the September 11th attack on the U.S., ending Al-Qaeda's safe haven in a place called Kandahar. Once again, Al-Qaeda forces were sent scurrying to seek refuge and create havoc in other parts of the world. But before we go any further, I do think it's important that I give you a little context of, uh, about what we know about the rise and fall of the Taliban. So we can see how events in one part of the world frequently create events in another part of the world. It's all connected in this tapestry of history. Now to understand what led to the current situation in Afghanistan, you would need to examine a great deal of history, but I'm just going to ask you to step back just a little bit to one recent pivotal event and take a look at this man called Ayman al-Zarawi, who is still alive and is now the leader of Al-Qaeda, and who began his path toward global infamy while he was a doctor in Egypt. Now, before he met, al-Zarawi met bin Laden, he led a group of urban guerrillas known as al-Jihad. In 1981, Al-Jihad teamed up with another group in Egypt known as al gama al-Islamiyah, the Islamic group. And what did they succeed in doing? Killing Sadat in 1981. They also tried to kill his successor, Hosni Mubarak. But Mubarak proved to be even tougher than these Islamists, and he brutally crushed them, their families, whoever got in the way. Now, I covered Egypt during this violent period when bombs were going off regularly and even school children were caught up in the crossfire between Mubarak's forces and the Islamic militants who were bent on unseating him. But instead of crushing these Islamic militants, Mubarak forced Zawari and his followers out into the world 
to find a safe haven, a place to wage a bigger war, a war not just against Mubarak. They, that was little potatoes at, at that point. They wanted to really wage war against the power that was keeping him in power. And who was that as they saw it? The United States of America. Zawari's so militants fled to Sudan first, where he was welcomed. They were welcomed by Hassan Atarabi, once known as the most dangerous man in the world, and Omar al-Bashir, leader of Sudan. Now, Sudan did prove to be a safe haven and allowed Zawari and this Saudi named Osama bin Laden to set up jihadist training camps in their country with the goal of starting a worldwide war against what they saw as American and European domination. They charged that the world powers were exploiting the resources of their lands and keeping despots like Mubarak in power to do their bidding. Now I interviewed Tarabi at his home in Khartoum and he explained to me why Sudan had welcomed bin Laden and Zawari. He fashioned himself an intellectual Islamist and his goal was to develop an international Muslim think tank where all factions and Islamic creeds from the most peaceful to the most militant could come together and rethink Islam for the 20th century. His dream, that was the 20th, we're now on the 21st, but his dream was not to be, however. The United States then put pressure on Sudan to expel bin Laden and Zawari. Bashir imprisoned Tarabi and kicked both bin Laden and Zawari out of Sudan. Now, I had to give you that history because where did they go when they were kicked out of Sudan? You guessed it, Afghanistan, where the Taliban were all too eager to welcome them and to help them set up shop in Kandahar. Now the rest, as we know, is modern history. Thanks to their safe haven in Afghanistan under the Taliban, New York has two fewer skyscrapers and thousands of Americans have died in this war against Islamic extremism. President Obama argued during his first campaign that Iraq was the wrong war, but Afghanistan was the right war. And once he was able to draw down US troops in Iraq, he increased troop strength in Afghanistan to stop what seemed to be the Taliban's resurgence there. Now many people will argue that the Taliban cannot be defeated militarily. And there are reports that the US and Afghan President Hamid Karzai have been in talks with Taliban leaders, apparently in recognition of the stark reality of their continued influence and power among Afghans, especially in the Pashtun ethnic group. If Obama holds firm to his timetable, in one more year, it is Choda Hafez. And what is Choda Hafez? Uh, there's w two words I want to remember, it is goodbye. American troops are saying Choda Hafez to Afghanistan, or we hope, or it is said. But the question I want to leave with you, as you've seen what happens when you know, these, the decisions are made and these people get pushed out into other parts of the world, the question remains whether Afghans will really be able to establish a stable government acceptable to international standards, or if the Taliban and the remnants of Al-Qaeda are simply waiting for US troops to leave to renew their push for power and create their ideal Islamic state. Unless something changes, Afghanistan could be unstable for a very long time. And American troops may leave only to have their grandchildren return to fight the next generation of Taliban. Thank you. Good evening. 
It's very nice to be here and see some of my old friends and make new friends. And it's, uh, Harrisburg is becoming home now. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I fall asleep, you have to keep me awake because uh, I, I arrived only yesterday from Kabul. It's 14 hours of flight to Washington and then two and a half hours of driving and, uh, and there is nine hours of time difference. So for me right now is, uh, is morning. It's like 4.30 a.m. <laughs> so and I didn't get any sleep last night. I was awake at two o'clock emailing. So um, I, I'm going to show you a very short uh, film and then after that we can have a conversation and to keep both of us awake <laughs> so it's too high tech for me people are hungry for education. The main cause of violence and corruption is the lack of a population that is educated. the whole population and not only a privileged group. I just came back from Samangon province where I visited our school. We have 12 year olds sitting at first grade and then we have 25 year olds sitting at seventh grade. <laughs> Five-year-old who's sitting at seventh grade told me that it's her husband who encourages her to go to school and have a high school diploma because he doesn't have the opportunity. He had a sixth grade education before the wars and he doesn't have the opportunity to have a high school degree now. This is why it's crucial that we provide education for male and female in Afghanistan. Afghanistan for Education is working currently in nine provinces with 13 schools, with 3,000 female students and 104 male students. And we wish to expand to as many provinces as we can to educate the population. <laughs>
only counterinsurgency is through education and not war. And this has to be an international effort. We need our international allies to help us educate the Afghan population and to help peace in the world. It seems strange to say uh, uh, peace in Afghanistan brings peace to the world. Um, but fortunately or unfortunately, we are very integrated now and we can't deny that. Um, there are, you've already heard a lot of history and, um, and a lot of uh, background on who the, the Taliban are. I just have to clarify one thing. And Joyce may not agree with me. Um, <laughs> and that is the fact that the Taliban were not a government. Um, I, I came to visit the Taliban, in fact, in 1999. I lived in America, by the way, for 23 years, and I went to visit the Taliban in 1999, and this was not a government. This was a group of extremists running running a government, but they couldn't really figure out what a government was. And the purpose was not to run a government. The purpose was to take over Afghanistan as a space to operate uh, their terrorist activities and, and mainly to bring their own version of Islam, not only to Afghanistan, but to the rest of the region and to the world, because their whole idea was to um, to, for, the, for the end of the world to come, because that, that's when life actually starts. Um, so anyhow, um, there are some um, future, um, future is difficult because in Afghanistan we don't really contemplate on future too much, and, and we don't really project. Um, we, I mean, what's important is now, and, and what's happening now is what's going to create the future that's coming. Um, so um, I'd like to share with you some of the things that's happening now, and hopefully that will bring us a brighter future. Um, there are some facts that we, we just have to know about what's going on in Afghanistan right now, and, and I think part of it is because of, because of this harsh reality, uh, what's happening is what's happening. Um, and, and that is the fact that there is a very, very high illiteracy rate in Afghanistan. Um, the, the, some of the uh, surveys show that there's 26% illiteracy rate in Afghanistan. Well, if you go out to the rural areas, then there is 93% illiteracy rate amongst women and 67% illiteracy, illiteracy rate am amongst men. So how can we bring peace to a country unless we educate the people first? Because when, when people are illiterate, then it's easy to, uh, to brainwash them, then it's easy to come and say, you know, because they can't even read. I mean, we learn to read the Quran. Afghans can, m m many people have memorized the Quran, of course. Um, even, well, I can read the Quran, I can recite all sorts of, um, verses from the Quran, but I don't know what I'm saying. And I still don't know what I'm saying because I don't speak Arabic. 
And if you don't speak the language that you are reading your book, you, how would you know what it says? So you just believe whatever somebody else comes and tells you that what this says, and they just have to believe that. And it's very unfortunate. So I, I, I believe that unless we, we educate the population, not just children, and not only male or not only female, but the whole of population, um, we're not going to bring peace to the world. And that's what we are doing in Afghanistan. And as an organization, um, so I think it would be really best if we sort of have a conversation. I don't want to tell you a whole bunch of things that you may not want to know. And what would you want to know from somebody who has just come back from Afghanistan? I, I did live in the US uh, for many years. And, and I went back home. Um, as of 2001, December of December 21st of 2001 is when I landed in, in Kabul uh, because I was very happy that the Taliban are gone and now I, we can, I can go back home and do what I really wanted to do because I had visited there in 99. I went to Pakistan to visit the refugee camps in 1995 uh, where I witnessed where for the first time I realized that there are illiterate people in the world. Because when, when we were the privileged group in Afghanistan where education was provided for us, we were forced to go to school. And, um, and I had no clue that majority of my own country is illiterate. So that reality woke me up and, and I felt that I have to do everything I can to make sure that nobody. Can you put yourself in place of a 20 year old who can't read or write and how she feels or how he feels? We have many, many, I mean, we've totally denied and, and ignored the male population in Afghanistan, which is a huge problem because no matter how much we educate the female, if, if the man who she's going to marry is illiterate, her life is not going to change because he will not allow her to go. I mean, he doesn't see the value. And, and then so fortunately, you know, I, I think once you really have your heart in the right place and you really want to do something, then the rest of it just falls in place all in its own. Um, so I have been back since 2001 and, and things are going well. In fact, you know, things are going very well in, in many ways, but we still have a long ways to go. And, and we can't really do it on our own either. We need partners who have the same vision where we can really focus on partnership within um, colleges, schools, high schools. Um, we need partners in all different levels. I'm, I'm at the um, advisory uh, committee of uh, an MPA program at University of Kabul and there are so many problems and, and I don't really, think that we're going to change all of this overnight or by 2014. It's going to change in 20 years, maybe. You know, we've already gone through 30 years of war. We need another 30 years. So did you have a question? We focus on w certain groups only um, because the government's supposed to take care of the rest of the country. So we focus on people who didn't have access to education during the years of war because w during, for example, during the Taliban era of these seven years, they banned women from going to school, period. And then when I visited in 99 and visited some of their schools, um, the boys were not learning anything either except 
indoctrination of their own version of Islam, uh, so many people didn't send their boys to schools either. Um, and then before that, 10 years after the Russians de were defeated, when the factional war started, there was, there was serious war. People were getting killed every day. There, was, there were bombings and, and they destroyed the whole city during that period. Um, it, was, it was difficult for people to go to schools, so majority of the schools were closed. So there are thousands and thousands of men and women who don't have access to education right now because in Afghanistan there was a law if you, um, you had to be seven years old to enter first grade. I think pa back in the 60s and 70s, um, they, they enforced that law in trying to encourage people to send their kids to school because school was compulsory. Um, but now, unfortunately, nobody realized that this has to change. Now we're dealing with another issue. So they still take, they changed it a little bit, not really on the paper, but they take uh, up to age nine and to first grade. But if you're 10 years old and you never had access to education, you, you, you're not, there's no place for you. So we take care of those that cannot get into the formal schooling or the returnees from Pakistan and, and Iran and they don't have proper documentations or they never really could go to school because in Iran, um, Iranians didn't allow Afghan refugees to go to school. Um, so we take them and it's an accelerated program and also we don't give them four months holiday in the winter time like normal schools do. Uh, we heat up the schools and they finish 12 years within eight years with us and then they receive their high school diploma from the ministry. We do have an agreement with the ministry and we work very closely with them to make sure that our students will, get, will receive their diploma. No, and, and in fact, surprisingly, I, at the beginning, I thought that we will, have, we will be facing a lot of problems, but I think this last 30, 35 years of war made Afghans realize that education is very important, and the families are very willing to send their boys and girls and anybody that you're really, we receive a lot of demands for same type of schools for boys, and, and I'm hoping that we will be able to do that um, in fact, we give the students one month off once. It, it, was a, it was a harsh winter and we give them a month off. In fact, fathers came back and knocking on the door and saying that when are you gonna reopen my, my daughter's board? So it's, there is really, uh, there are occasionally, there are communities that we have to convince, um, but it doesn't take very much. Um, and they, they, we hire the teachers and then the teachers go out and in the neighborhood and explaining what we're doing. So suddenly, you know, doors open up and, and they really um, are very open to, to educating their children. If, and they, they do understand that once uh, their children are educated, they will have a better life, they will have a better income, um, things will change for them. And they, they see a little bit of that. They see that the younger generation um, of Afghans who went to school in Pakistan or abroad and they returned, they have jobs where they make so much money that they would have never imagined. But tell me about the school that we have. Mm. Well, yeah, well, one of our schools was, was um, attacked in, in Wardak province, which is only an hour from Kabul, uh, sort of southeast. No, south, southeast, thank you. Um, and that we didn't reopen it because the villagers asked us not to because it's not a safe area. The security has gone down quite a bit in that area. And, um, but it was, it was, we were very lucky because our principal, in fact, was sitting on top of the building every night with a gun watching and these people who have somehow placed these uh, bombs on all four corners of the building didn't really have the time. There was a rocket that hit one wall 
but they didn't have the time. He started shooting, so they didn't have the time to, um, what is the word? The, to the yeah, de de detonate, detonate <laughs> yes. <laughs> to detonate the, um, the bombs around the building. Otherwise, the whole village would have been gone. Um, so people are very supportive, and we still uh, did some work with this with this community because we had a, a, um, a library in the school, and the library was moved into uh, the principal's house, so students would still come and borrow the books and read, and we're in I, touch I with just want to say, I think it is fair that she has a higher tolerance than probably we would for the dangers that she's facing, so when you hear her say that it's not that bad, it would be bad for us. That's <laughs> so relevant. Yes. Um, I was wondering if your plan on having two higher education locations was a part of the director's civic program and her and Tom's um, letter of intent to go to the United States, or do the students have to pay a tax? Does the government support them in any way? How are you able to do this? Or how can you help us do this? <laughs> <laughs> Can, can we save our questions? This is really great. We're having uh, a wonderful discussion already. We do have one more panelist, mm -hmm. and I think once we open the mics, we'll be able to. Can I answer uh, her question? Because she may that. forget. So I just, I would like <laughs> to, uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, we were, at the very beginning, we were funded by Danish Embassy in Kabul. And then in 2000, for four years, uh, since 2003 to 2007. And then in 2007, USAID stepped in. So I didn't really go around and look for funding from five different donors because we focused so much on the program that having one donor was really perfect for us because then you, it's less reporting, let's work. And um, it made things a lot more transparent and it was easy. Um, but now, this year was the very last year for USAID funding because of everything that's happening here and the budget cuts and, and they, they're saying that they don't have any money. In fact, we are running out of money by March 17th. And uh, we are starting a sponsorship program where people can sponsor a student uh, or two or five or however they want. And the cost of each student is $1.75 per day. So $1.75 per day is yeah, <laughs> not very much money, yeah? Um, so that's, that, yeah, then why don't we yeah. go to Matt and yeah. then we c I, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. You know, you know, I'm really sorry to break that up to talk about boring congressional stuff, because um, that was really some good dialogue we had started there. I hope we can continue that. I'm also sad to stand behind the podium. It makes me look so short. Um, that's okay. When you're six foot tall like me, you get used to uh, looking short next to the podiums. It's totally fine. So um, my mom, I consequently, I, as I drove up here, I called my mom tell her I was doing. She told me not to open with jokes because I'm not that funny, and I just didn't listen. <laughs> so here we are. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, my uh, background is sort of a unique blend in that. I served in the military as an intelligence analyst, and I've come to Quakerism in my young adulthood uh, under the belief that peace is possible through peaceful means. And I've talked uh, at this uh, university before about uh, my transition and some of those things, and I recognize some faces in here. Uh, I'm happy to talk about those things now or after. Uh, but my, my real focus tonight is on sort of what's missing, what, what the focus should be on, and what's missing, and what you all can do. Um, I think right now we are at an unprecedented moment in the U.S.-Afghanistan policy. We have built a winning coalition in favor of ending the war in Afghanistan. The Senate in November passed a resolution, uh, an, uh, an amendment rather, to the National Defense Authorization Act that said, uh, yes, President Obama, we want you to expedite the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, and there should be no troops in Afghanistan post-2014. That is one of the biggest anti-war victories, if you could call it that, uh, in collective recent memory. So uh, that, that vote on that amendment was known as the Merkley uh, Afghanistan Withdrawal Amendment, uh, passed 62 to 33. That's almost enough votes to pass a treaty. Uh, so we saw enough bipartisan support around that amendment to really give us pa pause. Now there's an issue here. 
there's sort of an asterisk because we have a winning coalition to end the war. That coalition, which is made of unlikely, uh, unlikely partners, the Tea Party libertarian types and the very progressive Democrats, uh, falls apart when it comes to the long-term picture. And this is a real problem because after being in, involved in Afghanistan for 12 years, after spending over $600 billion and thousands of lives, tens of thousands of Afghan lives, uh, we have some type of obligation to make sure that the situation doesn't devolve into all-out civil war. So uh, with that, there are five areas where I think the U.S. Congress should focus. Now, some of them the U.S. Congress can actually do something about, and others they, they should sort of acknowledge that there needs to be that, create the space and provide the funding if necessary, and then step back and let the process happen. Uh, one is the political and economic transition. Right now we hear all about the military transition. The most recent announcement in the State of the Union address by President Obama was that we're going to withdraw another 34,000 troops by the beginning of 2014. Well, that's great. We should withdraw those troops. In fact, we should draw, withdraw the rest of the 34,000 that are there because there is no military solution for the conflict in Afghanistan. That's the, the military transition side, right? There is almost nothing to be said uh, in these policy circles on the Hill within uh, different uh, you know, uh, apparatus that actually make these decisions and implement policy on the political transition, the elections in April of 2014, beyond the elections of, of uh, 2014. Uh, the current uh, status of political negotiations. Right now we're focused on the Taliban and the Karzai government. I think that's wrong. We need to focus on those 95% of people that are being completely isolated by these negotiations. So that piece is missing. The economic piece is huge. 97% of Afghans' GDP is derived from international donor dollars. Guess what? Most of that's going to dry up in 2014. What does that do to the Afghan economy? What, does that, what is the impact of that? There's almost no meaningful conversation at the policy level on those uh, factoids. So this is really, really critical, and I think this is where Congress can have the most impact. Uh, Congress is responsible for authorizing and funding uh, all types of programs related to Afghanistan. They do it every year. They authorize in the uh, defense uh, authorization bill. Uh, the NDAA, they appropriate in the Defense Appropriations Bill. Both In both bills, the, the, um, the section is called Overseas Contingency Operations, or in our D.C. shorthand, we call it OCO. Uh, OCO's loco, you know, all that sort of stuff. But uh, this OCO funding is going to endure. It's going to be there past 2014, and there are a lot of programs uh, and other things that can be funded through that that we really need to focus on. Just four other things that I think Congress has less a role on, but that are equally as important, in some cases more important. Uh, there needs to be, and there already is to, at some degree, uh, civilian and civil society dialogue in Afghanistan. We have to empower, uh, the, the uh, ordinary Afghans have to be empowered. Not, not, not that we, the U.S., have to empower them, but there needs to be a space provided for that. Um, we need to uh, sure up the gains, uh, the education gains, the gains in health care, the other gains, however small. We need to shore those up, and we can do that by um, providing the right uh, funding mechanisms and, and accountability and oversight mechanisms. That's a little complicated. I could probably spend another 10 minutes on just that. But that's uh, another thing that the U.S. could sort of focus on, the international community can weigh in on. We need genuine conflict resolution not just political negotiations for a ceasefire or for uh, some kind of coalition government. We need to look back over the last few decades, realize that, Afghan that Afghanistan went through a very bloody civil war. And the scars uh, of that civil war are all over Kabul. I was there in August of 2011. You can see it in the dilapidated buildings all over that city. And you can see it in the lines of the faces of the people you meet. It is, it is not uh, a bit of history for the people of Afghanistan. This is a fresh, fresh wound, and it has not been addressed. It has not been dealt with. Uh, we have, you know, empowered warlords over the last 10 years. Those warlords are main power brokers throughout the country. There needs to be some ki kind of legitimate um, conflict resolution taking place between those ordinary Afghans and these uh, warlords and other groups around Afghanistan. And last thing, uh, and sort of to, to sort of wrap this up, um, the Afghan National Security Forces. Uh, Pakistan, this regional conflict, these long-term regional issues, 
are sort of the Achilles heel of any good policy. There are plenty of good policy proposals out there. But if we don't look regionally, if we don't acknowledge that Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan is not Afghanistan, but it is India, if we don't acknowledge that India's interest in Afghanistan is not Afghanistan, it is Pakistan, and are willing to at least start multi-track or single-track talks between uh, uh, Pakistan and uh, India and other regional partners, including Afghanistan, if we don't start uh, to do those sorts of uh, processes now, you might as well forget it. I mean, we're we're at a really we're in a really bad place if we can't do that. So uh, I know that's difficult. That's a you know a half century prospect. It's not something that's going to be fixed by 2014 or even 2024 when the U.S. is uh, currently committed to fund the Af uh, Afghan government and military through. But these are issues that we need to take up now. We need to start taking up now to have that long-term strategic picture figured out. Um, and I'll just close by saying, you know, there is something you can do. Um, as John mentioned, we were in Senator Casey's office this morning, and his staffer, uh, Damian Murphy, uh, whom I know from the D.C. office, said directly to all of us, we need your advice. You are constituents. We need to hear from you. These policymakers sort of have the luxury of being in D.C. and operating in a vacuum sometimes, and it's good for them to be reminded that they have smart, educated, and interested constituents around their state that have a stake in this, that realize some of their friends, some of their family members, people they know, have had a personal interest or, or have been lost because of the conflict in Afghanistan, uh, the conflict in Iraq, and so on. We have, we have an obligation, I think, to ensure that we're not setting up the conditions to see this happen again in 10 or 15 or 20 years. What that means is you all have to be active. How many of you in this room, just think to yourself, could point out Afghanistan on the map of uh, the Middle East? Well, if you said yes, you're wrong because Afghanistan is not even in the Middle East. So. <laughs> Think about that. Um, we, we are at a real disadvantage. We have been in this country for over 10 years, and we have obligated uh, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. In the long term, it's going to be four to six trillion dollars. That's the cost of, including the cost of care of veterans and interest compounded on that debt. That's on our backs. No one else's. We're going to pay that debt. And I, I mean, we as in people of our age range. Now I'm getting a little out of it. I'll admit I got a birthday coming up, but that's okay. Uh, seriously, though, we, we, are, we are at fault here. We need to be more engaged. And you can do that. My organization provides those tools, uh, provides the, the knowledge, the organizing, uh, the lobby workshops, and so on. Come down to D.C., we'll set you up. Um, we have a, an event, consequently, I'll just uh, end on this. Uh, we have an event in March. It's called the Young Adult Spring Lobby Weekend. It's March 16th to the 19th. I have flyers over on the table. This year, our issue is climate change and conflict. And what this really is, is uh, 20 colleges and universities around the country participate. We bring people down to Washington, D.C., we train them on the issues, we train them how to lobby, and then we unleash you on Capitol Hill to, to find your collective voice for these peace and social justice issues. This is an opportunity, and I hope you'll think about taking it. Uh, come to me after for more questions or pick up a flyer, and there are emails for more information on that flyer. Thanks. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, I was sorry to interrupt the questioning before. I know there's a lot of energy here. Uh, we do have a mic that uh, Jen will bring around. Um, please raise your hand. Uh, the mic will try to get to you. Uh, please state your name and direct your question to one of our panelists. Who will be first? One over here. Okay, my question, uh, I don't know whether you, whether you figure it's, it's not exactly relevant, but I sure think it is. What happens to all this work that you folks have done over there in trying to educate young Afghans? What happens to all this effort when the U.S. pulls out? And I'm talking about militarily, because my thinking is that's the only thing that's keeping the lid on right now. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I don't know if this mic is on, but you can hear me. Yeah? Um, so that's why we have to hurry up. We have two years, and y y if you all join me, then we'll do it fast. We'll have to educate <laughs> everybody. <laughs> and, then <laughs> and then Afghanistan will be on its own once U.S. troops pull out. Uh, U.S. troops or some of them are pulling out, and um, um, I, I think there are just mixed feelings amongst Afghans and um, they, they're concerned about security. Of course, you know, Afghans don't want another war. They're tired of war. And, and I don't personally believe that there's going to be another war in Afghanistan because things have changed quite a bit. The, the, I think we forget that why Taliban showed up in Afghanistan. It was, it was under certain circumstances that the Taliban uh, with the uh, use of uh, CIA and ISI and a lot of foreign hands, uh, walked into Afghanistan uh, to bring peace. Um, but uh, n things have changed since then. This last 10 years, yes, it maybe isn't where we expected it to be, but there has been huge amount of progress in Afghanistan. Uh, many of the warlords, in fact, who were involved in wars um, now have made investments in Afghanistan. They don't want another war. The war will hurt them financially, and they don't want that. So I don't see another war coming into Afghanistan, and Afghans don't either, and I, I think people will do everything they can to make sure that that will not happen, and that doesn't mean that we're going to have a peaceful society free of corruption because we're going to have a very corrupt government, I have a feeling, for a while, unless we educate the people in various ways and to make sure that we will encourage um, Afghans, uh, Afghan diaspora to, to return to Afghanistan, educated people who can come back and work. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. It's not so black and white and we shouldn't think that, okay, well, U.S. troops are leaving and now Afghanistan is falling into another war. No, that, it's not like that. Although it's fair to say that she doesn't believe U.S. troops are really leaving. <laughs> I don't believe America is going anywhere from Afghanistan, but, you know, that's, that we'll, 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 we'll find see. out. We'll <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> You know, I, I think that there's an infrastructure that exists around the U.S. military presence that when, when the presence uh, diminishes, when we begin to leave and eventually completely leave, because I think eventually the U.S. has to completely leave. We can't keep troops in Afghanistan forever. We could maintain a base, but Afghanistan is not Germany. Uh, it's not quite the same logistics. It's not quite the same uh, in terms of uh, cultural acceptance and, and so on. So eventually we'll get to a place where there will be zero troops. And I think part of that may come because Afghans say we want the U.S. troops out, just like the Iraqis did uh, in 2011. There's an infrastructure that exists around that presence that I think once it leaves will be, um, will be hard for a lot of people to adjust to. Uh, there are a lot of people who have made uh, a living off of the U.S. presence. Some of them are insurgents and they've been uh, paid not to uh, fire rounds at convoys. Uh, by private security contractors. Uh, some of them are NGOs doing all types of work related to the military presence uh, and Afghan NGOs, Afghan groups, and so on. Uh, the reality is, though, there is not a military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. And if we can generally accept that the U.S. can't stay forever, either the political will to stay doesn't exist or the financial ability to stay doesn't exist, then eventually the U.S. Um, will leave anyway, right? So. Sooner is better than later. There's no reason to prolong the military presence if we can say that there's not a military solution. And, um, and uh, generally speaking, uh, we're not, um, you know, in some places we are more than others, but generally speaking, we're not that welcomed as a military presence. I think it is uh, sort of conducive um, and, and sort of an American-centric view to say it's also not worth any more lives. I think the, the war in Afghanistan is not worth any lives, Afghan, American, or otherwise. Um, but the, the message that I've heard consistently on the Hill, especially from uh, sort of the conservative contingent of our coalition, is that um, there, it's not, the conflict isn't worth any more lives, and there's no reason to prolong the presence. So I think when you take that sort of combination of factors, 
um, and, and look at it even from the military's per perspective, um, it's just a matter of time uh, before the U.S. leaves. So it's a, not a question of uh, when, if rather than when. And I think uh, at the end of the day, there will be a transition period. It may be hard on many Afghans, but I think Afghanistan will be much better off in the long term without a U.S. military presence or an active uh, U.S. war in the country than with it. But we also have to remember that why, why America is in Afghanistan is a very important question to contemplate on because then we may realize why America should still be there and or why is it not going to leave. Um, Afghanistan is not Germany, but Afghanistan is a very important uh, regional location for America and, and we have to look into why that is. Um, and, and when why Americans are very interested in that. And also the other thing is that I, I believe that no country should have military bases in any countries. And every country has to be sovereign and, and do whatever they want to do uh, within the UN Charter. But then um, currently the Afghan military is set up where America is paying for it. And America will be paying for it unless we change that system. And America cannot leave that for the Af the Afghan government will never be able to pay for the, its military, the way it's set up. Um, so unless that changes, America can't go anywhere because, and, and also at the same time, whether America is there or whether America is paying for our military, we're not going to be a sovereign country. So no matter what, we're still going to have tax dollars going to Afghanistan, <coughs> and a lot of it. Oops, sorry, there's a question here. Uh, <clears throat> John Craig from the uh, Center for Global Understanding and Peacemaking. Hasina, um, you said in the beginning that you went back to Afghanistan in 2001 because the Taliban was gone and you saw this opportunity for a new uh, society, a new beginning in Afghanistan. And that, th that feeling very much pervaded Washington at that same time, October, November, December of uh, 2001, that the Afghan people welcomed the liberation of uh, Afghanistan from the Taliban, and that this would be the beginning of a new chapter for uh, of, of Afghan society. What happened in, uh, in, the, in those uh, months that changed that, and, and why did these other forces come to occupy that space, to use the, the words of the day, and push back this tremendous enthusiasm, this great hope that Afghan society would free itself. And the others can, uh, it's actually, I think the, the other two will also have to uh, uh, For the whole, <laughs> for, <laughs> I'm gonna summarize the past 10 years of what <laughs> happened. Um, I, I think yes, we, we, there was a lot of hope within the, la within the first two, three years. Um, and, and many Afghans returned back to Afghanistan who are no longer there, unfortunately, now. Uh, because we had this, uh, um, this high that, okay, well, things will be back to normal and we're going to have uh, an Afghanistan which we had left in, in 1978. And well, no, we were all wrong because people changed, things have changed. Three, 30 years of war, I wasn't there, we weren't there. I mean, our group who came back to Afghanistan realized that different people, different, it's, a, it's a different place. And, um, and then suddenly money poured in from all over the world and, and America paid majority of that, that funding was coming from the United States. And Afghans somehow, I feel like, didn't really have the opportunity to figure out what the real problem is <coughs> and where to even start. Starting a whole country from scratch again, um, we didn't do it ourselves. It was done for us. So I think whenever um, somebody else tries to resolve a problem you have in your home, 
it's not going to happen. Your personal problem will not be resolved unless you recognize the problem, first of all, and then you come up with a solution to resolve the problem for yourself. And the solutions that came from outside of Afghanistan obviously has, was not the solutions that Afghans wanted or Afghans never really had the time to even not only recognize and come up with a solution for their own problems, uh, they didn't really have the chance to figure out what kind of political system do we want? What kind of economic system do we want? Uh, everything was imposed. So n you can't really help somebody else unless they ask for help. Um, so right now as it is, we don't take ownership of this democracy we have. We don't have an ownership of the uh, peace processes. We don't have ownership of the elections. We don't have ownership of the economic system. Nothing is owned by the Afghans. It's all dictated from outside. The only thing I'll add to that is I, I remember very clearly, and, and she may be right or she may be wrong, but Layla Helms told me just as this whole thing was collapsing and she was going to have to go into hiding having been the Taliban spokesman, she said, Joyce, the Afghans are the Taliban. Now again, I'm not saying she's right or not, but she was giving me a signal that as much as we like people like Hasina, she may or may not be all Afghans, that there may be a large group of Afghans who really do want a way of life like the Taliban would offer. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I think part of the problem is that we frequently only talk to those people that are comfortable for us to talk to, and that's how we think they want us there, or they're happy that they're there. We don't talk to those who don't express the values that we share. And I would simply say that in my time on the ground, there are a lot of people, like it or not, who, have a, who think it's just fine to have an Islamic state. So we have to come to grips with the fact that there are different ideologies at work in the world, and they're not always conducive to what we may want into our own national interests, but they're there. And sometimes they may be the majority. Yes, but I think that we have to very clearly understand that there is a difference between Islamic State and the Taliban. You will find very few Afghans in Afghanistan supporting the Taliban. They may want Islamic State, but but having the Taliban is not Islamic State. That's not Islam, what they're, what they're practicing, in fact. Uh, in Laila Helm, the, the, the supporter, there, it was a st strange to have a women, there were four Afghan women who were supporting Af the Taliban. Well, in fact, Laila Helm is not, in, uh, she, her father is Afghan. She was born in America. She was raised in America. She was only, she only w because she was married, and she is still married, I guess, to the, do the son of the head of CIA, and she was getting paid very fat salaries to support the Taliban, uh, and she ended up going into Afghanistan a couple times when the Taliban were there. So I think that we can't really re rely on Laila Helm's uh, information on what Afghanistan state should be. Uh, just briefly, from the, the American perspective, mostly the military perspective, uh, the, the conflict itself correlates perfectly with the troop presence. Um, really, from 2001 to 2006, we never really had more than 30,000 or so U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the strategy was escalated. It, you know, I'm going to be cynical for a second here. Having uh, a little bit of uh, understanding of the way the Pentagon itself works and the way some of these structures work, uh, as one war was winding down, one was ratcheting up. I think that was no accident. Um, in uh, 2007, 2008, President Bush sent troops to Afghanistan. In 2009, read Bob Woodward's account, Obama's Wars. It's an excellent account of the escalation, uh, which became known as the surge, uh, which really was about 50,000 uh, uh, troops altogether sent to uh, Afghanistan between the end of 2008 and 2011. Uh, and, you know, naturally, uh, every, everything, all the metrics go up. There are more IEDs, there are more, more troop deaths, there are more civilian deaths, uh, and so on. All of that happening as the war escalates. Um, what we really saw from about 2001 to about 2006 was a nation-building effort that failed. And it failed in 2006 and 2007, and then there was a doubling down of the war. Some people will tell you that the Taliban began to return. Uh, which came first, the military presence or the return of the Taliban? 
I think only history will be able to tell that full story. Um, to my mind, I think the escalation came first. So um, that all, you know, coupled together, now we're sort of on the tail end of this. Uh, we withdrew troops in 2011, we're withdrawing troops now. Right now, there are around 68,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. By the uh, beginning of next year, uh, by February of next year, President Obama has pledged that there will be only 34,000 troops. We'll be back to sort of the early 2000 levels, uh, a decade and a half into this war. And um, what we've seen is just a mirror. Uh, you know, it goes perfectly. As we escalate the war, the animosity goes up, the insurgent attacks go up, the Afghan civilian deaths go up. As we de-escalate, all that stuff's going down. In fact, I read an article the other day that said uh, the U.S. has had no combat casualties in the first uh, two months of this year. This is the first time uh, since the early 2000s that that's been true. So uh, we're seeing um, the, the sort of the de-escalation of the war. Yes, in the early uh, phase, Afghans, I think, were more supportive of the U.S. invasion than they became uh, in, in the mid-2000s and certainly than they are now, and I think with good reason. And those of you in my classes will, will recognize that uh, phrase that what you push pushes back on you. <laughs> um, we'll make this our last question and then we'll, we'll move into some uh, refreshment time and uh, you can continue the informal discussions. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I'm Mike Long. I teach many of these uh, cool students here tonight. Thank you, students, by the way, for coming out. Uh, Hasina, I love your point that education is a form of peacemaking and that it's an avenue to peace. And, but as you were saying that, I was thinking, wow, we have some really highly educated people here in the United States who have led us into some horrible and unjust wars through the years. So I was wondering uh, about the type of education that you practice. Uh, do you teach peace and nonviolence and human dignity and social justice, or are you teaching just remedial skills, reading, writing, arithmetic? Are you teaching basic values in your, in your schools as well? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, when people ask me what I do, I say counterinsurgency. <laughs> and, and then they expect to see some sort of a military uh, uh, outfit and they don't see that and they get confused. But I think um, it depends, you know? I, I think in the, U in the US, because we ha I don't know what literacy rate is in, the, in America. <laughs> it's high. Yeah. It's high. It's Okay, well, it, I think in a society where you have 90 some percent of, of literacy rate, um, then maybe we should, because there are always people who create problems in every society. I don't think, it, it doesn't mean that just because we educate the population, we're going to have peace forever. There will always be people who are angry no matter what. They're angry for various reasons. Maybe, you know, this capitalist, uh, capitalism itself can make people very angry because not everybody has what they, they want to have. And, and everything that you have is a, is a temporary happiness. So then we should work on a whole other uh, level of education for the society. Um, but in Afghanistan, where majority of the people don't even understand what they believe in, and they can't even read or write, um, it's different because it, the, the happiness that you see in their eyes when they actually can read and write and, and they can read their rights even, or understand what people are talking about, or they can go and if there's election time, they go and read about this person who <coughs> has been elected, and not only because the first election, I remember that for every candidate, uh, UN made a, um, um, uh, a logo, um, or what is it, a logo, a symbol, a symbol to identify that person or that group that was a, like a set of animals out on all sorts of flowers and all kinds of things because people couldn't read. Um, so I, I think it's a whole different level of, you know, once the whole population um, can read and write, then we can think about um, doing other sorts of, uh, of education for them. But we do um, have to use the curriculum that the government use because uh, 
uh, we have to make sure that our, our students will receive that high school diploma from the ministry and that's very important for them. So they do have a little bit of time here and there um, that we can inject something else for them and, and we do. Um, but uh, as it is right now, we don't have a focus on, on teaching anything else. We talked about that and she said, yeah, they had to follow the curriculum. But the, but the one point that she made, and I think that really needs to be reiterated, that they understand what Islam really is and what its teachings are is paramount, even above the other, you know, the conflict and all that, because they're being told <coughs> Islam is this and they should kill themselves to kill other people. And that is what has to be retaught. And that's, that, that curriculum needs to be changed. And the madrasas are a good way to begin to change that, getting inside there. Well, thank you, um, you panelists. You've given us some, some things to do. And as we think of ourselves as civil society, uh, there are some things that you've suggested tonight. Uh, we can study history. We can, uh, for $1.75 a student a day, we could support someone directly. And we could uh, write to those people, uh, policymakers who are making some of these decisions. So uh, we can be involved with this issue directly. Uh, let's give a, another round of applause and thanks to our panelists.